Let's take a walkthrough of the Inquest File Detection and Response platform. And you know, first and foremost, what are we focused on here? You know, predominantly our goal is to protect users, you know, versus servers or applications. And generally we want to do this by taking decision making out of their hands. In a large enough pool of users, we find that users interacting with files is generally how folks are getting their initial um, hooks into enterprise networks and then delivering payloads from there, whether it's ransomware, um, you know, some kind of trojanized rootkit or any kind of uh, you know, nefarious uh, deed behind that actor. We generally focus early in the threat sequence and typically you know, call this over 90% of th threats are gonna start with an email. You know, almost every single corporate user out there is reachable via email. Uh, attackers know this and it's a great way to, to get a foot in the door. So common campaign, you know, maybe we start off with an email. There's some form of, of file-based lure. It could be a phishing attempt. Um, it could be a, a malware attempt, infection attempt. But generally, there's going to be some kind of email being sent to uh, the user. And this is where our first line of defense comes into play. It's, it's carrier detection. Uh, Inquest Deep File Inspection will blow apart file formats, and it makes it a lot easier for our signature uh, developers, your threat hunters, and our machine learning models uh, to detect you know, either threats or sensitive information. So this is our first opportunity to stop a uh, inbound attack is early in the threat sequence, prevent the delivery of this malicious email. Assuming we miss that aspect of it, generally there's going to be some form of pivot to another next stage payload. You know, in this example, I'm demonstrating with PowerShell, maybe it's VBA, maybe it's an LNK file. Uh, there's always something, some soup du jour that the malware uh, community is following and it's constantly changing. Um, and again, where is that payload coming from? Could be coming from a compromised website. Uh, maybe they set up their own infrastructure. You know, in this case, we're, we're seeing a, a, a compromised WordPress site. Very common pattern seen in, in nature. Um, and this is our second opportunity to stop the threat. We can potentially anchor on the actual um, infrastructure itself or perhaps on the communication pattern or maybe even the SSL certificate that's being used to, to protect the communication. So this is the, the second step uh, that we have the opportunity to stop this threat. You know, the next one is on domain names, IP addresses. You know, maybe we know that there's a malicious um, AWS server IP out there, a command and control um, endpoint, you know, like a Cobalt Strike server of some kind. And so even if we miss the, the, the pivot, perhaps we can catch the final beaconing out, you know, phoning home to receive instructions, um, you know, to do some, uh, some nefarious activities. And finally, uh, there's an opportunity to stop uh, whatever the final payload is. You know, maybe it's a piece of ransomware that's going to be coming down onto the user system and then spreading laterally there to lock folks uh, out of their systems, you know, asking for some form of, of Bitcoin remuneration uh, to get those systems back. So very typical um, uh, attack sequence. And let's take a look at a, a, a real world threat here. So, you know, one of the neat things that we do, we dog food our platform. Uh, we're ingesting malware at scale and using Inquest Deep File Inspection. Um, you know, our automated, basically virtual analyst is able to bubble up interesting files from you know just the general wild. Uh, and we do this as a form of demonstration. Obviously, if we can do this on the world's data, you can do this specifically on your own data. In this case, we have an automatic tweet that came out from uh, the TFI stack, if you can believe it. Um, it, it tweets out about once or twice, um, um, you know, a, a week, every other week. Um, and every time it finds some novel, novel malware with some live uh, pivot point. In this case, they were using Bitbucket. Um, and actually, if you follow this, this uh, Twitter thread, you'll see that we actually included Bitbucket in the thread at some point. They were able to take this down, you know, hopefully before uh, there was, it had too much opportunity to do damage. Because if we look at it, and we can just pivot right over here to Inquest Labs, it had fairly low detection on the AV scale. There's something like 70 AV engines on virus total. Only seven of them were able to detect this initial file as malicious. We detect it as malicious, and one of the reasons for it is because it contains this visual lore. Very common for attackers to try and coerce um, their victims into enabling you know, embedded macro in this case. Um, we're able to detect this because the Inquest DFI stack is actually pulling the, the content out of um, this image and that allows it to uh, detect the sense of urgency and assume that this thing is going to be bad. And here's that Bitbucket uh, reference. 
You know, this is also a very common tactic. Uh, the actual like meat of the malware doesn't come with the original email, but this reference, this external reference is gonna pull in this .m file um, and that's gonna contain probably the actual malicious um, uh, VBA, uh, which is what they are asking us to execute here. Now, when this is emailed out, here's what it looks like uh, coming into me. What you're seeing up here is an inquest banner. Um, this is in our email security product. So if you uh, have something malicious, it's gonna have a red banner. If it's suspicious, it'll have a yellow banner. Uh, if it's just an external uh, file, it'll have a gray banner. Uh, you have the opportunity to report this email through a web interface. We can tune this thing so it can be really skinny if we want. Uh, we have it in verbose mode here. Generally, the idea of the banners is let the hairs on the back of the necks of the users stand up when they're looking at and potentially interacting with content that could be malicious. Now, of course, we wanna block these things. As I mentioned earlier, ideally, you take the decision-making out of the user's hands. But when we first start off, generally, we'll leave it in banner-only mode, decoration mode. Um, we'll let the customer get comfortable with it, do some banner tuning, and then when we're ready, we'll actually enable some form of, of uh, block and tackle. Uh, you know, perhaps external malicious mails or automatically admin quarantined, um, you know, many different options there. Now, we're, we detect there's a password protected file here, right? So this um, zip file, you know, titled Incredible Offer, um, it's got a, a password protection on it. Um, and actually, Inquest DFI is able to take this password and use it to crack open this um, uh, this uh, password protected file and actually get at the meat of it to analyze and detect that it's it's malicious. So you know, one more layer of obfuscation from the attackers makes it very difficult for people to detect this, right? You take a malicious script and it, let's say it can be detected. Malicious script inside a document, throw it at your email, it's detected, all right? Now separate it using that template trick that we just saw from that sample that pulls from Bitbucket. Let's see if you can detect that. Put that thing inside a password protected zip. Can you detect that? Layer it in two files. Can you detect that? These are really super trivial things for an attacker to do. And it's an asymmetric advantage because it's difficult for defenders on the, on the flip side um, to take apart these various layers uh, and analyze what's underneath it. Let's take a look at what this looks like inside of uh, the platform now. So here is a session details view. Um, and, you know, mind you, for email security customers, a lot of folks don't even log into this thing. You know, we basically built an MRI machine for, uh, for threat hunters, network analysts, uh, you know, folks who are doing file analysis at scale, but it's not requisite to be used, right? There, there is a virtual analyst here. It has an intelligent threat scoring system. It can integrate with other components, you know, play nice with other components in your network. If you have a sandboxing solution, if you have some kind of multi-AV solution, uh, we can just work directly with them. In fact, we'll make them better because DFI will do things like crack open content and expose something that perhaps your multi of you can detect if we pull it out, but on its own, it's not going to be able to, uh, to, to find it. And obviously, the more you throw at it, uh, the better your detection is going to be. We're a big mantra of, we're a big proponents of the mantra of throwing everything in the kitchen sink at the problem. So if you can stack Inquest DFI with multi avian and sandboxing, some form of detonation, that's the best of all worlds. Um, that's going to be your ultimate file wall there. So diving into the session details here, uh, we scored a seven out of 10. Our threat scores go from zero to 10, and we will have less 10s than nines and eights. Um, our out of the box settings are to block or to decorate red at six and above. So this would be a, a block decorate. Uh, we try not to artificially inflate the threat scores of things that are heavily detected by multiple uh, components. And I'll show you what I mean there uh, in, in a minute. You know, the idea is that we want folks to focus on the tens first, then the nines, then the eights, and so on and so forth. For threat hunting purposes, uh, generally we'll tell people look at scores of fives or fours. You know, perhaps if you have the bandwidth and the team and you want to, to ensure that nothing has passed your defenses, you know, maybe one of the workflows that you have for your guys is that they, uh, they're they looking for sessions that scored a four that maybe contained a PDF file if, you know, the guy's a PDF specialist um, and it maybe has some evasive characteristic. And I'll show you how you can do a search for that uh, in the platform in a, in a minute. Um, we've got some headers, email headers. Um, all these are searchable. Any of these can be alerted and pivoted on. 
You can see the actual red banner uh, show up here inside of our uh, platform, inside of the, 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 the session details view. So this aligns with the red banners that the customer saw. We can see the email body in plain text and HTML, assuming that you know each copy is there, depending on uh, the email, it may or may not have uh, one or the other. Uh, here they are again. There are three attachments to this email. You know, the most interesting one, of course, is the incredible offer.zip. Uh, we can see what file events fired on it. We can see the output from deep file inspection. So here is the password that we use to decrypt it. We can actually see the content there. So here's the password that was used. It came straight out of the email automatically. We can see the contents of the document here. I don't think there are any actually. It's all embedded. Yep, it's empty. It's all embedded within the uh, within that image, within that malware lore. And actually, let's go find that. Here it is. Extracted with OCR. So now this is all selectable uh, content here. On the top right, we have workflow status. So I'm working on this. Let me mark it as such so nobody else wastes their time and double you know, overlaps with um, uh, my analysis here. We can see that there are three contributing factors to the threat score, header content analysis, pairing modifier, and the threat discovery engine. These are all in quest proprietary uh, engines. They have green check marks, which means that each of those subsystems provided intelligence and moved the threat score. So this seven is an amalgamation of these components. A yellow would indicate that that subsystem provided intel, but it did not move the threat needle. Uh, red would mean that it did not provide any intelligence and black or grayed out means it's just not available. And we can expand this list to see all the other options we have. So archive recursion, blacklisting, cloud reputation, entropy analysis, malware discovery, you know, none of these subsystems provided any intelligence to our threat scoring algorithm, our IQ score. And here's all the list of components that are either unavailable or not configured um, at the time of analysis. So here's a, the in-depth view of that, that session. Now, we know that this references that second file from Bitbucket and beyond email visibility, if we're either deployed, we can deploy on-premise, uh, we can uh, connect to proxies via ICAP. We can uh, look at uh, data in transit uh, on the network, or we can ingest email logically in line inside of your G Suite or O365 tenant. Um, we have an API capability. So there's a myriad of ways of getting data into the platform. The goal is you know, every single file in the environment, in motion, in use, at rest, we want to see it. We want to ingest into the platform. We want complete file visibility, including any envelope around that file. So if it was sent in an email, I want to know everything about that email. If it was downloaded in a web session, I want to know everything about that web session. So that second pivot, assuming we have web visibility, we're going to capture that file as well. And here it is. This one scores a 10 out of 10. So, th and this makes sense, right? The other one is stage one, this is where the actual payload is. This is the main meat. This is when we transition from taking over the system, the local system, to going out and getting some content um, and, and downloading that, that payload. Now before, we're in a session details view. So there are header information, you got the full IQ score, uh, and of course you can pivot in between these two. For example, if I want to just see uh, this file by itself, I can go to this first scene as, and now I'm looking at the file view for that uh, initial uh, that initial lure, that initial carrier document, and we can even pivot to various um, sessions. You know whether it's a uh, web, seen ICAP. This would be web sniffed off the wire. You know ICAP proxy. Uh, we can actually pivot to the various sessions that it was seen. We can see that actually there's two emails, two independent um, sends that contain this file. Going to the seconds one here. In addition to having signatures that fired uh, from, from the inquest uh, heuristics engine, we also have a AV scan result. This is the malware discovery engine um, that is bundled with, with inquest. We have a number of different lenses that we leverage to determine whether or not something is bad. All baked in, built into the product. Malware discovery engine, threat discovery engine, there's a heuristics engine, there's machine learning models, and then the IQ score We'll look at all that, any additional reputation we might have from cloud integrations, uh, any information we might have from, from third party 
like OpSwat, for example, or VirusTotal if you have multi-AV integrations, Joe Sandbox, VMRay, Cuckoo, uh, Palo if you have any of these uh, sandbox environments available to you. And I'll show in a bit um, how easy it is to integrate with those, those platforms. Similar to before, we can walk through the actual output, the file tree. You know, DFI typically results in a 4x increase in content. A megabyte comes in, you'll have five megs to look at you know, on the output. Uh, this, of course, uh, makes our storage a little bit more difficult. And that's why our retro hunting capability is so impressive, especially when you look at it on premise. All of our systems are capable of doing, out of the box, by default, a two week automatic reassessment of all captured data, this is sessions, headers, files, derived files for deep file inspection, anytime new intelligence put into the product, which Inquest Labs is publishing at least once a week. Um, and anytime one of your own analysts puts something in, it's going to kick off that automatic reconsideration. We know we're not as smart today as we're going to be tomorrow. So if we've got some new intel tomorrow, perhaps we will provide an alert for some session that we uh, witnessed and in, in, in ingested you know, 10 days ago. A great use case here is uh, for example, we are a Microsoft MAP partner. This is an active protection program, tier two at that. It's a very exclusive uh, program, um, very hard to get into. You gotta be heavily vetted and it's for good reason. What we get from Microsoft is information more than the public does, more detailed information about the vulnerabilities that are being patched in Patch Tuesday. That gives us time to write well-engineered detection logic um, and be ready to go. So we're not having to be reactive when these patch Tuesday comes out, like everybody else having to reverse engineer patches and try and figure out root cause and then write detection, we're able to get that information and write signature content beforehand. Um, and it's really, it's, it's super valuable. Um, you know, kudos to, to Microsoft for maintaining that program. But once these signatures go out, especially if, if one of the vulnerabilities that were patched was zero day in the wild, we might be able to detect that our customers were, were targeted by that zero day um, you know, once those signatures go out on, on Patch Tuesday itself. Oh, well, let's go take a look at, in this case, going through the different files and folders in, in DFI. Here's the actual extracted macro. We will deobfuscate. If there are um, uh, encoding mechanisms, we will both detect the encoding mechanism as an evasion characteristic, but then we'll also decode it so that our malicious characteristics and suspicious characteristics signatures, as well as our models, um, can infer what the, the actual intent was by the code behind it. Inquest signatures at fire are actually visible. And, and as an analyst, this is awesome for me because I don't have to download the file or do anything. I can see right within the, uh, the web interface what fired, what specific bytes it fired on. And this will help if I want to go pivot and do further investigation. And if you want to see the entirety of the file, uh, that's doable as well. Where are we? So now we can just page through the, the actual code. Um, you know, clearly this is hex encoded, some kind of uh, a pivot payload here. Uh, DFI actually will decode this, write it out into another file, and we can just keep digging through this, um, you know, if we, if we so desire to. The final payload that is downloaded is so email is sent, password protected zip file. Inside there is a document that pivots to another document that contains malicious VBA that then pivots back to that bit bucket and pulls down this executable, this 123.exe. That is this component right here that you see one of our, our colleagues talk about somewhere in this, in this tweet chain. Um, someone else has actually pulled out and actually, I believe we can see it here too. Let's go find that second document on labs. Uh, Inquest Labs, by the way, free resource always will be. Um, it's a crowdsource effort bringing file data, both uh, malicious, benign, suspicious, reputation data, aggregated across a variety of different sources um, and indicator data scraped from Twitter and blogs and all this into one place. You know, the general idea is that you come here to hunt for novel malware 
Um, you extract the indicators. You see if anybody has reported it on RepDB or if anyone's talking about it in the IOC DB. And if not, you know, the suspicion is you've got something that's novel and it's worth your time to dive further into uh, and investigate. You know, this is fueled by um, a lightweight version of deep file inspection. Um, and this is the actual dog fooded product that resulted in this automatic tweet over here. You can also see our, our machine learning classifier is 96% sure this thing is malicious. Uh, and here is that component I was looking at. And down here you can see um, we've got the, the next layer, 123.exe right there. Uh, in this particular case, we detected this via our malware discovery engine. Again, it found this to be a six as well. So if we were integrated with your uh, proxy through ICAP, uh, this would have been blocked as well. You know, early in the threat sequence, we have detection here, basically catch the initial lure by decrypting it with the password, catch the pivoted lure. In this case, it was off a Bitbucket, not a, a, a compromised website as I showed in this example. And then finally, grab that XE, detect it as well. And instead of come from AWS, it also came from uh, that same Bitbucket. All right, so that's a walkthrough of our uh, it, we've showed the email banners, an example of it, a red one. We showed what it looked like to analyze that session inside of the Inquest platform, as well as the web session, um, as well as that final uh, executable payload as it came down. Let's go take a general tour of uh, the interface. It's a general walkthrough, starting with the dashboard. You know, in this case, this is a demo, so all the bells and whistles are enabled. You know, depending on how you're ingesting files uh, and sessions, you know, different aspects of the system uh, may not be visible or they may not have any, uh, any actual data inside of it. So here, we've got example data everywhere. Um, we're showing, you know, there's two hosts. We've got a, a manager and a collector. Um, when we deploy on premise, we can use virtualized uh, collectors. We can do turnkey hardware appliances. Our appliances range from 100 megabit to 40 gigabit. They're all one RU rack mount. Um, and I can guarantee you're not going to find a smaller form factor, less electricity usage, um, and uh, throughput for the cost. We are generally faster, smaller, cheaper, better than the competition when it comes to uh, network ingestion. We're doing 40 gigabit in one U, and that includes retro hunting capability with full deep file inspection. So we're grabbing all those files, that's millions a day, uh, analyzing at scale, multiplying them in, in size by five, so it's actually increasing the size. And still, you can manually retro hunt for 30 days, and typically um, the default window for automatic retro hunt is two weeks, but that can also be adjusted to 30 days. It just simply takes longer uh, to go through that, you know, that much more data. In an environment like that, typically a retro hunt will last a couple of hours, you know, maybe three to four hours to, to go back and reconsider all the data based off of uh, new intelligence. A variety of different queues here. These are all the different internal components as well as you'll see we're connected with a Joe Sandbox and a VMRay Analyzer here. We're able to multiplex between them. Um, I'll show that when I go into the uh, settings and show how we can actually uh, integrate with these devices later. Our pew pew map, you've got to have it, totally useless from the perspective of an analyst. But if you don't have a good looking map, you're not going to end up on the stock dashboard. And you generally want to do that um, because it looks good. So now we've got threats coming in over time, uh, data loss events over time, uh, command and control activity to known command and control IP addresses and known command and control uh, uh, domain names. This is Generally, we focus very early in the threat sequence, but the command and control gets us the very tail end of it as well. And our command and control data is really, the, it's the pinnacle of our threat intel. Um, it is 80% self-sourced, you know, consists of less than 50,000 indicators, um, very, very high fidelity. We monitor the, the uh, firing of these, of these indicators in the field very closely. And I, you know, I don't every day show off a press release, but I will for this. This press release, we put it out in August, it was about, there was a joint advisor from CISA FBI around some Chinese APT, and they released this in July 19th of 2021. 
They put out uh, something like, here it is, 49 indicators they put out. 12 of these indicators we had in our feed to our customers. And look at the dates here. This column shows you when the customers were notified. So 2017 Q2. 2017 425 was when it was registered. It wasn't disclosed publicly until 2021. We're talking about a four year span. And this is the, the grade of uh, Intel that we're doing. You know, our company was founded by SOC analysts. The product was built by SOC analysts, for SOC analysts, you know, living out of the basement of the Pentagon. Uh, the company founder, uh, Mike Arcamon, founder and CEO, he ran the Pent SOC cert for 15 years. All right, they were protecting from, ba from uh, uh, back plate to, to, from backbone to wall plate. They're protecting the Pentagon Enterprise users, not just the five wedges, but something like uh, 60 locations in the, in the capital region. And so, you know, these guys were, they had the luxury of a, a near limitless budget, 24-7 team, one of the biggest offices on the planet, and obviously one of the most uh, heavily attacked. So these are the kinds of Intel guys that we have, folks who follow the intelligence doctrine. That's how we're able to get this kind of lead time on these indicators. We didn't get them all, but it's not bad. 12 out of 49, it's 25%. Back to the dashboard here. Uh, below the, gra uh, the overview graphs is uh, the top graph. So, you know, top threats, this is a list view. You know, these are five tuple information here. Uh, we can drill down into whether it's web sessions. So now we'll see like verbs and whatnot, uh, mail sessions. We could look at SSL. So we've got various uh, fuzzy hashes, JAW3, JAW3S, and we publish threat intelligence to detect malicious um, certificates as well. So even if we miss the, the carrier and the infrastructure or the communication pattern, perhaps we'll, we'll capture the, we'll anchor on the threat based off of the SSL certificate in use. And this has happened in the past in really surprising cases, cases where OPSEC was really high on the campaign, but then their Achilles heel was they reused a, a certificate. Uh, data at rest, ingestion, we ingest off of uh, a Windows file shares, you know, SIFS, Samba, uh, command and control activity, uh, IPs and domains, you know, going back and forth. Most folks, most analysts, if they're inside of our um, platform, are going to live inside the analysis pane. This is where you can conduct various searches. So perhaps we want to see, let's just go look for um, source IP, you know, China perhaps, since we were just talking about that press release with the uh, APT actors there. Let's go look in the past seven days. What kind of sessions have we seen uh, going to and from uh, China? Maybe we want the subset of these actually are threats or data loss. So we can drill down there. You can see the variety of every single tab. You're going to have the, um, the ability to, to search specific columns, you know, so five tuple information. Um, you know, header information, file information, indicator information, malware events. Uh, so different slices of, of data here. Uh, going back to source IP country, China. Change the time interval to a week. And so this will be the subset of sessions where there was some threat score uh, coming from a source a session with the source IP address in China. And we can change the sort order. Uh, you can change column visibility here. Uh, you can refine your search with with additional columns, you know, etc. We can strip away five tuple information and go to protocol. So let's go, for example, and actually, you know, again from from the press release, um, Isabel Quinn, market analyst. Uh, her email and, and name are fairly public, so she will see. And she gets her fair share of uh, attacks. So we're going to go to protocol header session. And we want to see what emails have been sent to Isabel Quinn at inquest.net in the past seven days. Sure. And let's go look at a top threat one and dive into the details pane here. So we got a 10 out of 10 here. Look at the threat score contributors, malware discovery engine, threat discovery engine, both fired and moved the needle. File entropy, inquest pairing modifier, supporting evidence, but didn't move the needle. Um, and these are the things that were uh, unavailable, didn't fire at the time. 
So as an analyst, immediately, I'm going to know this is a true positive because there's a lot of the IQ score is telling me there's a number of different subsystems that are, are giving me supporting evidence here. Now I can go pivot to see, hey, did this Angel D'Amato send any other emails to any other people in the past seven days? Let's go see who else he emailed. Going back though for now, what do we have? It is a Word document. We've got an alert from the malware discovery engine. Some PowerShell heuristic has fired. Let's see what we have in the file events. It's the embedded macro. This is actually one of our machine learning uh, models. Produces this, automatically produces the signature and updates the signature. Um, we see that there's some embedded scriptlet as well. There's hidden PowerShell and a number of other signatures that fired here that, that factor into the threat score. We can browse the files through deep file inspection. And you can write custom signature content that will, Im that will fire an anchor on any specific um, DFI output. There was an image embedded in this image. We can go take a look at that. Here's another graphical lore um, coercing the user, in this case, trying to convince Isabel to enable the embedded malicious macro inside of this file. Let's go take a look at the extracted IOCs. Now, the, the IOC extraction is purposefully wide. Why? Because lots of times we have things that look like IOCs that even if they're not, they provide us with a good pivot point, a good anchor. It's a unique string that we can use to pivot to find other related samples. And then if we want to improve detection logic, in this case, we're totally fine here with a 10 out of 10. Or if we want to go just do a triage of who else was affected here, what other types of, of files, um, you know, maybe there's eight different samples across five different emails targeting 20 different people. This IP address stands out, right? This is from the VBA wscript.run. It's not a real indicator. Um, this doesn't look like a, a legitimate IP, but this one does. And if I pivot here in session, it's going to go through mail, but I want to go look at, let's go find web sessions that may have had this um, IP address, that might reference this IP address. And let's go look, we'll expand the window to 24 hours. And let's go see destination IP. So if Isabel interacted with that email, downloaded that file, opened it up, clicked on enable content, then her system would have been infected by going out to this IP address potentially, and that's what we're looking for, that beacon, and here it is. And it pulled down a file that itself scored a seven out of 10, so a malicious file. So now we know we have an escalation situation here. We have both seen a, an email that was delivered and provided a, um, a threat score of, of 10, um, but unfortunately, despite whatever banner was shown there, again, you want to take the decision making out of the user's hand. It's better to actually block than just decorate. They open the email, they interact with it, pivot it to this web session. We get that visibility there as well. We got the malware discovery engine, threat discovery engine, and pairing modifier fired on this thing. So we are certain that this is malware as well. And again, we can go through the file, uh, dig through the different components. Here, there was some base 64 encoded content that we decoded here. We can go see additional IOCs. This certainly looks malicious. Probably some uh, domain name generation algorithm, DGA. Um, and so there you have it. Just a, a very quick example of uh, walking through as an analyst. Other things in the interface, just super high level, reporting, uh, filtration, reducing what's coming into the uh, system, policy, we're multi-tenant capable. You were born out of the service provider space. Our biggest customer today is DISA. Uh, you know, we're deployed uh, globally and there are many systems where you've got multiple agencies, Army, Navy, Air Force, sharing the same hardware. You don't want their network data streams to cross, nor do you want their policies, nor their Intel to fire on one another's data. So that's where the policy section controls. Uh, administration, I'm gonna show in one second. That's where we're gonna dive into, uh, uh, take a quick look at integrations, what they look like. Uh, authentication, uh, by default, built in, on board, but we support upstream Active Directory, um, upstream LDAP, including upstream permission controls. 
There's also a manager of managers component. If you're looking to have a single pane of glass for pushing uh, tuning and configuration down to a global fleet. The knowledge base here is going to show us all the various uh, signatures. And let me showcase another partnership we have here. Uh, there's an offensive security research team in, in Austin called Exodus Intelligence. We have a data sharing partnership with them similar to Microsoft's map where they feed us their zero day and we write uh, detection logic for it. So our customers are protected against uh, zero day against Foxit Reader, Chrome, uh, Firefox, Adobe PDF Reader. And one of the best benefits that we get out of this relationship is not just the vulnerability information, but the exploitation information. There's a lot more malware than there are vulnerabilities and there are exploitation tactics. When we write detection logic for heap spray tactics in the browser or in PDF JavaScript, that's going to allow us to not just detect these vulnerabilities, but potentially other zero day that we don't even know about. It's a very valuable partnership there. Um, you know, and, and if you product customers can just jump in, do a search for Exodus to get a feel for which zero day we protect against uh, today. These other ones were patched, so they're no longer zero day. Uh, they they still have the word Exodus somewhere underneath it. Uh, that's why they're showing up in this search. So, administration. Under devices, each, uh, in the SaaS world, you can do this as well, but each device here has its own unique integrations and integration options. So the manager, uh, that the manager's horsepower will handle for ICAP, data at rest, API, manual uploads. Uh, the collector is responsible for you know high speed network uh, uh, traffic congestion and so all its horsepower is going into handling um, uh, the data that it's seeing off of the wire it has an additional statistics around the custom packet capture engine that we have under there and you'll notice of course zero percent packet drop that is typical and expected up to and including 40 gigabit bunch of different uh, all our internal systems recommend always leaving these on uh, and they come on out of the box, all these local integrations. Then external integrations, by default, we don't leave these on, um, you know, including any uh, uh, cloud reputation. You know, we won't even so much as do a DNS lookup out of the box. Um, you know, we're born out of a space where these things should not be doing any phoning home. But, of course, if you allow it to, it would love to ask our cloud for a reputation around IPs and files, um, as well as download updates, signature updates, uh, etc. We have an integration here with Joe Sandbox and VMRay, and it is as simple as putting in an API key and an IP address endpoint. That's it. Once you've done that, our system comes to life, just like an analyst would. It will leverage that technology, factor into the threat score, and if we're in line in email, that can drive our decoration and or block and tackle. There's options for um, multiplexing. Perhaps you've got a cloud-based sandbox you want to send executables to and a local on-prem sandbox you want to send all of your documents to because you don't want to push your documents out to a third party. So we can do that. Uh, perhaps you only want to send borderline files. If a file comes in at a five just below our default block, maybe we sandbox it to see if we can learn some more information about it to actually push it over the edge and block it. Uh, you know, different strategies for, uh, for different use cases. Uh, so that covers it. You know, if you want to learn some more, I definitely recommend checking out our YouTube channel, checking out um, labs.inquest.net. Uh, we've got some in-depth white papers if that's what you prefer to, to jump into. Uh, otherwise, feel free to reach out with any questions. Thank you for your time.